our assumptions. And um, one is just that we have a linear regression, which is the only regression we know right now, which is fine. Let's go through them one by one. So we have a linear regression model. Uh, two is that we have random sampling uh, of some sort. Three, no perfect, uh, no perfect collinearity. And this goes back to that multi-collinear uh, problem that we talked about earlier. Um, and again, these are all relatively technical. Uh, one is a zero conditional mean of our error term. That is, on average, our error is supposed to be zero. So we know we're going to make mistakes. But we assume that whatever mistakes we make are going to be, on average, zero. So we're not going to make the same mistake, consistently make the same mistake. Um, and that's the idea of the error term. The error term is supposed to include all those things that we can't account for. And we know they're out there, but they're essentially random. And on average, um, if we overestimate something, the next time we'll underestimate. And on, on average, they tend to zero out. So that's what that means. Uh, homoscedasticity is, is a mouthful in and of itself. Uh, and if you can pronounce it, that's, that's usually good enough. Uh, but essentially, it's homo same, scedasticity is scattered. It just means that the error terms don't get worse as time goes by. I mean, we're not going to worry about a lot of this stuff. And one of them in time series is that there's no serial correlation or autocorrelation. That is, our errors are not our errors from one period and a previous period are not correlated. And usually it's like t minus 1. So uh, errors from one period to the next are not correlated. That's supposed to be true. Oops. <clears throat> but in time series data, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense because when we're looking at time series data, what, what we're really looking at, or what we're essentially looking at, is human behavior over time. And people tend to do things, people tend to be pretty consistent in their behavior. So whatever mistakes we make in one period, we're probably going to make in another. So the error terms will tend to be highly correlated, over, or tend to be correlated over time, i.e. serial correlated, serially correlated. And that's actually not necessarily a bad thing because it's a good thing in that people are predictable. The, pro the only problem is that it violates this, this uh, set of assumptions that we have for, for ordinary least squares regression. But again, zero correlation, I think, is a good thing in that people tend to behave consistently, and uh, hence our, our error terms will often be um, serial correlated. Okay, uh, and then we assume that the error terms are normally distributed. So it's it's really this sixth assumption that we're we need to address. Uh, again, technically, if we violate these, we need to correct for them, and we're going to learn how to correct for this this today. So um, let's see, we can get a picture. Of it. Pictures are always good, and collectively, these are called the, the Gauss Markov theorem. Um, all right, let's get a picture. picture, picture, picture. All right, so here's our error term um, that is correlated with the error term in the previous period. So this Greek letter P, or rho, is called the correlation coefficient. And all we're saying is that our error term from this period is related to whatever mistakes we made last period. And again, a violation of our classical assumptions. We're going to assume that rho is somewhere between 1 and minus 1, so that the error terms don't explode. So if, they are if the error terms are correlated, they're going to diminish over time and we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. Uh, again, if rho is equal to 0, there's no, cor uh, no serial correlation. As it approaches 1, it means our, our errors in the previous periods become more and more, uh, are more and more highly correlated. Let's just say that. Um, if rho is greater than 1, it means our errors get worse as time goes, uh, as, as, 
our, our correlated errors in the past uh, become more and more correlated, which really doesn't make any sense because we would expect those errors to kind of diminish over time. So we're not really going to see that. Okay, so we know it's going to be between uh, 0 and 1. Uh, let's see what we have here. Yeah. So, again, this is kind of the key. It just means that our error term today takes on some of the error from previous periods. So, if we didn't, for all those things, remember the error term is supposed to include all those things we can't measure. We couldn't measure them today, we probably couldn't have measured them yesterday, and so on and so on. Uh, but getting an error term between 0 and 1 just means that we're going to, the error terms themselves, the, the, the lag error terms, really what we're looking at, are just going to become less and less important over time. Um, negative zero correlation is technically possible, but not very likely. All right, so, you know, that's the, so consequences of autocorrelation or serial correlation, which is the same thing. Auto means self, so um, our coefficients are still unbiased, which is good. So we're not going to screw up our coefficients. Uh, but they're not efficient in that they don't have the smallest variance associated with them. <coughs> what does that mean? It means that if the, if the variance of the coefficients, so we got our regression. Let's just take this out and see the simple. Sales equals beta 0 plus beta 1 advertising plus our error term. <coughs> These are still unbiased, but the variance of these estimates, uh, the error associated with, associated with these is going to be bigger than usual. And remember that our t statistic is equal to our predicted beta plus the standard error of the predicted beta. So if the standard error or the variance is bigger, then the t stats are going to be smaller. And it's going to make some of the coefficients appear to be insignificant when, in fact, they are significant. And that's really the main consequence. Uh, it's going to make, it's going to screw with our t-stats, is the technical term, and our f-statistic also. So that's really the, the major consequence of serial correlation, is that it doesn't necessarily root, mess with our coefficients themselves, but it messes with the variance of the coefficients so that our t-stats and f-statistics are going to be unreliable. All right. And again, this is just endemic in time series data. Time series, time series data is almost always going to have some degree of serial correlation. We just need to figure out if it's significant enough for us to take action. Um, it may screw up some of our, <coughs> our uh, measurement of r squared also. All right. So detecting serial correlation. Graphically, examine the residuals. Remember, serial correlation literally means that our error terms are correlated with themselves. So, let's see. Have that. so we can save the residual and just see if this, the, the residuals appear to follow any pattern. So if we go back to those assumptions for the error term. So it's all about the error term. or what we'll call the residual. It's all about the error term. Try this. Yes. <coughs> and what we're saying is that the error term, ut, might be correlated with some previous t in the past. Uh, plus the error term from this period. So that's what we're saying. Our error terms are correlated over time, hence serial correlation. <clears throat> so one way to do that is to, is to look at the actual residuals over time. The assumptions we make about the residuals are that, one, they have a mean of zero. Two, they're uncorrelated. And 
three and correlated over time. And three was that homoscedasticity. So when we look at our error, when we look at our errors, they should be, I can go back to kind of what the errors, they should just be random looking errors. Um, if there's a pattern to the errors, then the, that indicates non-randomness. So here's two, um, here's actual sales, here's predicted sales. We just ran a random regression. Predicted sales is our, our uh, predicted amount, and here's the, the regression. So you can't really tell, you can't really tell from this question, from this, uh, from this graph. So what we do is we save the residuals, and the residuals are going to be the difference between actual and predicted. That's what we're calling the error term, the residuals. So it's this di difference here. So let's graph the residuals and see what they look like. Let's graph the residuals and see what they look like. That's what they look like. Remember, the residuals are supposed to have a mean of zero, so there's zero in there. And that's probably true. If we were to take the, find the average of all the residuals, it would probably be close to zero, close enough to zero. The problem is that they're supposed to be uncorrelated over time, which means uh, we shouldn't be able to predict what happens to the errors. So again, they should be completely random. If you look at this, you see that we don't really see randomness. You see a pattern in the residuals. Uh, they're declining here, and then they start increasing here, and then they kind of decline there, and they increase there. In other words, there is a pattern over time to the residuals. If they were purely random, we should see literally, you know, it should just be all over like boom, 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 boom. It should look like that. We shouldn't be observing what we're seeing here, which is kind of they're falling and they're rising and they're doing that. So when they're falling, When they're negative, they'll tend to be negative again. And when they're positive, they'll tend to be positive again. So we're consistently underestimating over here, and we're consistently overestimating here. What we want to do is, we know we're going to be wrong, we're going to be, our, our predictions are going to be wrong, but we want those wrong, we want those errors, we want that wrongness to be completely random. So that on average, they zero out, and again, both these are going to have an average um, residual of zero. But we don't want to be able to predict our error. What we want to do is correct. Um, so this is saying that, that we know we're wrong, but we're going to underestimate whatever sales were, uh, sales. Over here, we were wrong, but we were consistently overestimating. Here, we're wrong, but it changes back and forth. Does that make sense, what we're trying to do? We don't want any predictability in the error. We want, the, we want to construct our models such that we've explained as much as we can explain, and whatever's left in the air is random stuff that we can't explain or that we can't account for. So this is a pretty classic picture of a pattern in the errors over time. Right? You're kind of seeing this movement here. As opposed to here where it just looks like there's really no, um, no pattern. So that's probably the simplest way, but it's a non-technical way, and sometimes you can't uh, tell 100% from looking at the residuals. Although, to be honest, 99% of the time you can just look at the residuals and, and tell. Okay, yeah, so the question is, does that look random? No, it doesn't. Uh, that would look random, that looks like we're seeing a pattern in, in the residuals, and there's not supposed to be a pattern in the residuals. They're supposed to be completely random. Okay. Um, sometimes we can have a poorly specified model that'll give us residuals with, uh, with a pattern in them. For example, perfect example is 
Say that we get a pattern of sales that look like this. Really obvious. <coughs> so you look at sales over time and you see that pattern. And what do we do? Well, we know how to run a regression, so we So we run this regression. Remember, essentially, what we have here is the equation of a straight line, right? So, what's a straight line? What's a straight line going to look in here? Well, remember, regression, ordinary least squares regressions find the, the 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 straight line that best fits the data. So we're going to get a line that looks something like that, where. Over here in this range, so this is our predicted regression line. So over here, we're consistently over predicting for sales, right? Over here, we're predicting, we're, we're consistently under predicting. And then over here, we're consistently over predicting again. This isn't serial correlation, this is model misspecification. We should have specified what? How do we account for nonlinear in 5A polynomial? Make it a polynomial. So we should have added, we should add plus beta 2, and we can add something like times squared. Plus ut. Plus ut. And that would give us the polynomial that would best fit the data. Something like that. Not specification error. That's just us doing a bad job of, it, of, of specifying the model. <clears throat> but you get a picture just like that because the residuals are going to have a, pr a predictable pattern. What we're saying is, even if we specify the right model, the model, the quadratic model, that we're still going to end up with some non-random pattern to residuals over time. And again, the key is zero over time. Okay. Zero killer. Someone that kills over time. I guess I should come up with a better, better, better example. But that's what I came up with. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, another way is to examine, so examine the residuals. Another way is to examine the autocorrelations. The autocorrelations, I got two books, are literally these things here. All right, this is how. The error term is correlated with itself over time. So basically, we want to look at this thing row right here. All right. And that's it. Okay. And these are our autocorrelations of the residuals. And you can see that. So uh, essentially, uh, the y-axis is the, the value of rho. And you can see that there's a pattern to them. That rho, so they're most highly correlated in the first period, less <coughs> correlated in the second, third, fourth, and then by the, it looks like the fifth, um, there's still that same pattern, but the correlation coefficient is not statistically different from zero. What's that? What's the gray stand represent? The gray is a 95% confidence interval. Okay. So if it's outside that gray, it's statistically significant. If it's inside, it's not. More importantly, however, is the pattern. There's not supposed to be a pattern to the correlation in these. So what we're seeing is, is literally the correlation coefficient between the error term and one period, the error term in the second period, the correlation coefficient with the error term in the third period, fourth period, and so on, and so on, and so on. And what we're looking for is kind of like when we examine those residuals, um, a pattern in those residuals. 
the pattern, I'm sorry, there's correlation coefficients. Uh, again, it's just a correlation coefficient between those. Um, let's ignore all this. Basically, we want that picture. Graphically, this is called a correlation. So, that picture is classic. Um, if they were all in the gray area, we'd be fine, but they're not all in the gray area. Uh, let's see. Did you make that graph in Yep. Even better than that, there's a command just for that graph. Oh, wait, there's one. Yeah. That's how common serial correlation is. If you're looking at, at time series data, you're almost always going to have serial correlation. Um, okay, so no autocorrelation. Autocorrelation should be zero, or at least not have a pattern. Uh, but here we have both. We have one, there's a pattern, and two, they're non-zero. Uh, you can look at the partial autocorrelation coefficient, which is similar to the autocorrelation coefficient, except it's um, it's essentially the coefficient from a regression of the error term on errors, previous errors. So instead of just looking at the pure correlation coefficient, we're looking at the, at a, at the coefficients of a regression on previous regressions. And essentially here this is looking at, we're trying to find the order of the correlation. So is it, this would be called first order serial correlation because the error term is correlated with one from one period ago. And this would tell us the order of the serial correlation. So that first one's significant, the rest of them are insignificant. So we would say this is a classic example of uh, first, period, first period serial correlation or auto correlation. Okay, and let's see. put these two things together. We look at them both. Uh, the autocorrelation coefficients, we're looking for the pattern. The partial autocorrelation coefficient, we're looking for the order of serial correlation. First degree serial correlation is the most common, but there are, you can be correlated with uh, uh, further back with your uh, error terms. All right, so pretty simple. We can, we can produce these graphs. It'll give us a pretty good uh, signal of serial correlation and the magnitude of order. Uh, and again, if there's no serial correlation, then nothing should be statistically significant, which is nice, which means it's not going to be a problem. Okay, so graphically, we looked at those three things. Uh, there are some tests. <clears throat> and these are things, uh, again, we can run in data pretty quickly. Uh, the first test is called the Durbin-Watson test. And basically, it's this Durbin-Watson statistic D is essentially, you could see it's just the difference between the error term and the previous error term squared over the error term squared. It's a lot like, <coughs> it's a lot like uh, the variance. If D is zero, there's going to be positive, uh, perfect positive autocorrelation. If D is two, there's no autocorrelation. And if it's four, there's perfect negative Autocorrelation. Remember, a uh, positive correlation is when is when the residuals follow a pattern like this. So when they're negative, they tend to be negative. When they're positive, they tend to be positive, and they're following this trend like that. So that's positive co uh, correlation. Negative cor uh, uh, perfect or negative autocorrelation doesn't really exist that often because it just says that. Uh, if it's negative, the next one will be positive, and if it's positive, the next one will be negative, uh, and so you'll get this negative autocorrelation. That doesn't happen. I haven't seen that. That might happen in engineering somewhere, or I don't know, but I haven't seen that. Um, okay, so we can calculate this German Watson statistic. Um, if it's two, no autocorrelation. If it's zero, it's uh, positive autocorrelation. So we want to see if, if our Durbin Watson statistic is, is literally statistically different from zero. We're looking at. Um, all right. Um, 
the Durbin Watson statistic has kind of outlived its usefulness. So it's not really used all that often, although in a lot of textbooks it's still covered. They've made some modifications to it, and now it's just called Durbin's Alternative Test. So Durbin-Watson testing for autocorrelation. Uh, the same type of, I don't have to go through all the specifics, uh, but the same type of um, calculations oops, uh, in that you run this uh, Durbin's uh, alternative test and we, we want to see if the, the, the test statistic is statistically different from zero. And again, there's going to be a fairly simple test for that. If it's zero, there's no uh, serial correlation. So the null hypothesis is there's no serial correlation. The alternative is that there is some serial correlation. So if we end up rejecting the null hypothesis, we're going to conclude that there is serial correlation. Again, it's just a test. Uh, the Burst Godfrey test. All these tests have limitations, so we usually run all of them. Um, it's pretty simple. So run your regression, save the residuals, which we'll call E hat. Regress your saved residuals on lag saved residuals as well as all the explanatory variables in the model. So you get some nasty looking regression model. Uh, obtain the adjusted R squared, <coughs> compute this N minus P times R squared, which follows a chi-squared st uh, statistic distribution, and compare it with a critical chi-squared statistic. So here's the nice thing about the Bush Godfrey test. We don't have to do any of this. There's a command for it in sake. So it's going to tell us whether or not we're rejecting the null of um, uh, no serial correlation. So we don't have to do that. Uh, Lagrange multiplier test is similar. Estimate your original model, save the residuals, um, lag the residuals by one period and then throw it back in the regression. So here's our model. We save the residuals, E hat, lag it by one period, throw it into the, into the regression. And if this has any explanatory power, remember the error terms are supposed to be random. If this has, a, if, if uh, rho or, or if ET minus one hat has any explanatory power, then we have zero correlation. <coughs> And hopefully we'll be able to do all this stuff. All right, uh, let's skip that. Again, this is going to look a lot nastier than. So, if there is serial correlation, we look at the residuals, we look at the autocorrelation coefficients, the partial autocorrelation co coefficients, we look at the Durbin Watson, Durbin's alternative, we look at Bush Godfrey, we look at um, the Lagrange multiplier test. If all of them uh, point towards serial correlation, we need to do something. We need to fix it. So how do we fix it? We use something called generalized least squares. And let's see if I can. Essentially what we're going to do is So we're going to use these methods designed to um, correct for serial correlation. The first one is the cock and market iterative process. And again, these are going to be pretty simple. Uh, estimate the original model. Uh, estimate the first order serial correla correlation coefficient uh, by regressing ET on the lag value of, the, uh, of itself without a constant. And then use the estimate of rho to, to estimate that 
nasty looking equation. That, repeat, that's going to be a new one. This keeps going. Um, this is a pretty nasty process. I'll show you the command for it. Copy and work it. Boom, we're done. All right, so that's one way. Uh, all right. There's another one called the Praise Winston procedure. And it uses an even nastier transformation. And I'll give you the command for that. Um, finally, there's something called the Hildreth Lou search procedure. So, Praise Winston, Cochrane, Orca are derived from models that don't have um, lags of the dependent verb. We're going to find out today that, that we're going to end up using lag dependent verb. So, we're going to have to use this Hildreth Lou search procedure. And I'll show you the command for that. <laughs> but essentially, all of these things. Let's go through this. Um, here's ordinary least squares. So I just ran y on x. There's serial correlation in there. Um, let's see. This was done with some simulated data so that we can see how close we get to the true value. So the true equation is 5 plus 3x. Um, and the error term is, is highly correlated with the, with the correlation coefficient of 0.9 with its uh, one period lag itself. All right, so how close do we get to um, the true equation? Our constant is almost six. The true constant should be five. Our coefficient on x is 2.86. The true coefficient is three. So as we said before, Zero correlation isn't really going to mess up the estimated coefficients. It's going to affect the t-statistics and perhaps the r-squared. Um, but we see both those are significant. If we run, uh, let's ignore that one. Let's ignore that one. If we run the Cochrane Orchid, uh, you see that our constant, or at least our coefficient, is going to be a little bit closer to the true value of 3. So it's 2.9 instead of 2.8. Not that big of a difference. Um, but again, the point of these um, corrective procedures is to fix the errors and not really, not, not necessarily the uh, coefficients themselves. Uh, let's run the, and this is the iterative procedure which we're going to do. Let's run the praise Winston. Again, we're getting the same coefficients. And we're still getting, um, yeah, we're getting almost the same coefficients. And then Hildreth Lou gives us almost, again, identical solutions. 